This will be our ninth message in the series on assurance. The tonight it will be on the evidence of assurance. Now the objective that I've charted out for myself in this message is to convince those that have assurance that they do have assurance. That's my aim. Now assurance is an aspect or facet of faith. That's why we read of the assurance of faith. Assurance is also an aspect or a part of hope. So we read of the full assurance of hope. And there's understanding involved in assurance, a full assurance of understanding the scriptures speak of. So assurance is not a feeling. Amen. It's something that's rational. It's something you can understand. It's something you can know that you have and recognize it. It's just that not many people talk about these things. So I think myself successful tonight if I could with the scriptures prove to those who have assurance that they do in fact have assurance and so you just don't have to guess at this or hope you do or but really know this in your heart. My text is 1 John 3.21 which brother Judah read, Beloved, uh, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. All right, we're going to work on that a little bit. Now let's talk for a moment about the realm of evidences. In Christ Jesus, there's a, there's a whole area of thought that pertains to evidence, uh, proof. Evidence is to the things of God like the trail of a star is to a star. Or like the shaking of a leaves are to wind. It's what's produced by the thing we're considering. So when we talk about the evidence of assurance, we're talking about the experience of life that evidences, that proves assurance is there. Now, of course, from one point of view, faith itself is evidence. Faith is the evidence. See, so that's of one point of view, faith or the persuasion, the conviction that you're no doubt what God has said is true. That faith is what get, gives that to you. Faith puts a handle on the truth so you can Amen. take hold of it. Now it's a different kind of evidence. It's not an evidence perceptible to the flesh. Some people when they think of evidences they think of archaeological finds and things like this. Well see these aren't evidence. These are not evidences of critical things of God. Amen. There's, there's, all, there's other kind of things in the archaeological digs that <laughs> you won't have a thing to do with God. So this is not where you want to seek evidence. In Christ, proof cannot be received by the flesh, perceived or received by the flesh, or by your natural understanding, or by your natural mind, or by your feelings. They can't be perceived this way. I know this is the case because Jesus, who was the real thing, he was not just a real person, he was the real person God promised. Jesus was in the world, John 1.10 says, Jesus was in the world, and the world knew him not. Why not? Because they couldn't. They couldn't recognize him. They thought of him as a rabbi, a teacher. Well, Jesus is a teacher, but he doesn't save you as a teacher. <laughs> He's a savior preeminently. 
and only the saved are really taught by him. Evidence is for the believer, it's not for the unbeliever. You got to really see this. Then we talk about evidence, it's not for the unbeliever. The only thing that unbeliever is is a gospel message is true and no evidence. We can't we can't prove that Jesus existed. We'll be right up front with you. We can't prove that Jesus rose from the dead. We'll be right up front with you about this. It can't be proved, but just not, not to the unbeliever. Because God is the one that opens these things up. Now let's see, some, there's some language that tells us about these things, that teaches us about evidence. And these particular texts have to do with knowing. And the knowledge is based on some evidence. I'm going to state what it is. 1 John 2, 3. Hereby we know that we know him. <laughs> I need some evidence. Do you know him? See, I need some evidence for that. Hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. If we keep his commandments. That's evidence, see. Now here's another one. 1 John 3.14. We know we have passed from death unto life. Alright, there's some evidence now of this. We know we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. That's the evidence. Yeah, that's right. A lot of people don't know this. They, they don't know this. So they really have an inclination to the brethren. They really prefer the brethren. The brethren of Jesus. Remember, we're talking about the brethren of Jesus. They're not, they're your brethren secondarily. Amen. They're primarily Christ's brethren. And God's children. So you know we passed to that death in the life because you love the brethren. First John three eighteen. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. We just don't talk about it. What we ought to do. But in deed and truth, and hereby deed and truth. Hereby loving and deed and truth. Hereby we know. That we're of the truth. And shall assure our hearts before him. So as long as you're like trying. Doing the best you can. Trying to meet the requirements. You'll never know. Now we're just pretending if we. You, you won't. Now it's just, that's just the way it is. But when you really do. Love the brethren. Now you know you've passed them. Death and the life. Here's another one. See, this is ever. This is all evidence. We're studying evidences tonight. By this we know that we love the children of God. Now, see, how do you know that? So, how do you know you love the children of God? When we love God and keep His commandments. <laughs> it's amazing. It's it's, it's actually. Staggers the mind. It sounds simplistic, but it's not simplistic. Mm -hmm. So if you really do love God, and you uh, you won't let anything interfere with your relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you love Him now. You'll not stand by and let someone badmouth Him. Yeah. No, you won't do that. Yeah. And whatever He commands, you don't say why. You you keep it. You keep it. That's your proof you love the children of God. Amen. That good? Yeah. <laughs> man had never come at it. The man had never come at it this way. He'd tell you, you know, got to have this kind of response, got to have that kind of response to the brethren. You have to have this. No, you have to have a certain kind of response to God. And when you have this certain kind of response to God, then you know. See, and nobody knows your response to God, That's right. but you. We don't know this. I can't look at you. I can tell how I can tell you love God. You, bottom line is this is this is a personal thing. So you know you love God. You, you know you give you know what you've given up for him. That's how you know you love the brethren. Here's another one. These evidences, see. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, and he that 
is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not, and we know. We are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. How do we know that? Because we're sinning not. We're keeping ourselves from sinning. And the wicked one can't have his way with us. He can call at us, come over here, but he can't, can't invade us. Ah. So that's the way you know you're of God. Evidence. Yeah. For, the, for the believer, there is evidence of assurance. That's what you want to deal with. Now, and again, my aim is to convince those that have assurance that they've got it. Yeah. Our text said, if our heart condemn us not. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean, well, at last I know I've never sinned and I... Uh, if your heart condemns you not means you feel at liberty to go to God yeah. okay. to obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need when you do come short you beat a path okay. yeah. to God now if that's your see that that's your case that you're not repelled see the unbeliever is repelled by God okay. the more God's made known the further back into the bushes they go that's just the way it is mm -hmm. But if you're not afraid to approach unto God, if you're not hesitant to acknowledge before God that you need something or that you've come short or whatever, you're not hesitant to do this, you've got confidence. That's a sign you've got assurance. You, you've got assurance. You may feel like the most condemned person in all the world, but if you draw near, you, you've got it. You've got the real thing. And loving in deed and in truth, that's, just, that's the evidence of assurance. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. Now this is the prelude to if our heart condemn us not. That's why I'm reading this. Hereby we know that we're of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him for... Huh? For... Yeah. If our heart condemn us God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things then the texts our text but if our heart doesn't condemn us yeah. which means we're loving in word and truth if our heart doesn't condemn us you, you've got it you've got assurance now if our attitude toward the saints is right it proves we're of God John 17, 14. I've given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. So if the world is obnoxious by you, and you're attracted to the saints, you've got assurance. You've got it. Let me lay down this, let me take this a little further. 1 John 3.16 Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for the brethren and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So you find this is not um, laborious at all. You're willing to forfeit some personal advantages in order to give some advantage to some of the people of God that need your help and uh, your brother been very kind and helpful toward us and I know that it took away from some of your time but you had this love of the brethren say you you weren't willing just to love in word you loved in deed and in truth and you're willing to lay your life down or put another or to lay it to one side or to take your personal interest and put them to one side momentarily so that you could minister to the people of God if you if you sense that you're you actually do that you got assurance yeah. that's the evidence of that's the evidence of it right there well let's just take another these are evidence evidences of assurance see 
You can look at these things like commandments, and they are. Or you can look at them like evidences. You can read the Ten Commandments, like what you ought to do, or you can read the commandments like promises that the new, of what the new man will do. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Same commandments. Right. Instead of reading, thou shalt not, you should say, well now, of all people, you will not. Yeah. You will not have other gods before you. See, you can read the Ten Commandments both ways. Yeah. And when you've come, you can read it with confidence. And you can say, hey, I can recognize, I can recognize that in me. You've got assurance. Amen. You've got it. Yeah. Here's 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Talk about evidences now of assurance. I keep under my body. I mean, that means I carry it. It doesn't carry me. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means after I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. So you find yourself, you know, you say to yourself, I'm making some progress, I'm making some progress in this area. I'm fine, I'm able to keep under my body. I'm able to make my body do certain things that I know it doesn't want to do. That's evidence. <laughs> That's evidence you got assurance. You say, well, I'm having a hard time. I didn't ask if you had a hard time are you buffeting it you might have had a hard time keeping it under but if you got it under you got assurance you've got it now here's an evidence of assurance your willingness to submit to persecution so someone lays it on you pretty hard this can range from words to martyrdom so you get all upset because somebody said something about you. Maybe even cry about it, you know. We won't weep with you on that. Sorry. Here's Paul, and he gives them evidence of assurance. This is evidence, proof of assurance. Because these things can't be done without assurance. See, that's the point. The things that I've mentioned thus far can't be accomplished while you're in a state of doubt. If you're unsure that you're reconciled to God, you're not sure you're a child of God, you're not sure you've been forgiven, you can't do any of these things I've mentioned thus far. They've designed to be done by people with assurance. All right, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 29-32. He's arguing for the reality of the resurrection of the dead. With some people in Corinth, their teachers had convinced them the dead weren't going to be raised. So he said, else, what then shall we do for them that are baptized for the dead? Now, the Mormons baptize living Joe for dead Ralph. I mean, but they're wrong, yeah, among other things. And some people think that that's what this means. Baptized for the dead meant somebody over here was baptized for someone that died before they could become a Christian. No, that's not what it means at all. Amen. Baptism here is a baptism of suffering mm -hmm. to where you're overcome with suffering and you're willing to die. That's what he goes on to say. For else what shall they do are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not? Why are they baptized for the dead? Why do I submit to, to possible death if I wasn't sure about dead being raised? Why would I do this? Why stand we in jeopardy every hour? Why do we endanger ourselves or put ourselves in a place of danger if we don't have some kind of assurance? Yeah. See? I protest to be your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily like I, I every day I submit to this process. If after the manner of men I fought with beasts at Ephesus, well, what that was, we don't know, but it doesn't sound like it was some small thing. What advantage is it me if the dead rise not? If the dead aren't going to be raised, let's eat and drink for tomorrow. We die. Yeah. All right, so here's a person, we trust it's you, that you're willing to live so you incur some opposition and some criticism. You, it isn't that we want this, but you understand it's going to come. 
but you live for God anyway, yeah. you've got it. Amen. You've got assurance. It's yours. Well, how about this? Approaching the throne with confidence. Hebrews 4, 16. Let's therefore come boldly. Boldly mean not, not like brashly, barging in, not that kind of boldness. It's courage and confidence. This is God we're coming. This is God we're coming to. Right. That told the people of Sinai, don't come near me. Don't even come near this mountain where I'm touching it. That's the guy we're talking about. Who's a consuming fire. That's the guy, that's the guy we're talking about. Let's come boldly to the throne of all grace who may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, so now a time of need arises. It covers a multitude of things that could be such a thing as uh, health, you know. Or you lost your job, you lost your house, or there's some dangerous situation in your house, it, disease. You, it, it's something men can't help you with. That's the time of need. It's something men can't help you with. Your wisdom can't help you with it. Nobody, nobody can solve it for you. And so you, without hesitation, you go... You go to obtain mercy and find grace to help at the time of need. The fact that you did that, mm -hmm. you got it. Yeah. You got assurance. That's why you did it. <laughs> Isn't that comforting? Amen. Amen. Hebrews 10.22. Let's draw near now. Let's draw. Let's get as close to God as we can, not as far from. See, some people live as far as they can comfortably live. Actually, the purpose is to find your comfort in being close. But some people, they, they draw back to a, at a distance from God, and they get so far they feel comfortable because they're not aware of God anymore. They're not thinking about what God wants. So that's a dangerous way to live. So if a person comes near, no pretension. It's with a true heart. And they actually do that. They got it. They have assurance. That's the evidence of it. The evidence of the assurance. Well, let's take another. These are evidences of assurance. If, if, the, if you've got these things, we don't have to discuss and philosophize, do you have assurance? You've got it, or you can't have these things without it. This is 1 John 5, 3. This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Amen. So you say, well, I know what that's all about. Commandments of God are good. Sometimes he'll ask you to do some pretty, forsake all. But yeah, that's, not, that's not grievous to me. I want to do that. That's not chafing me. No matter what he says, he says oh, look, if your mother or father, brother, sister, or your own life, if it comes between me and you, you got to choose me or I'll reject you. You say, well, I'm willing to do that, Lord. I mean, I know the world says blood's thicker than water, but I don't believe that. I believe my mother and my brothers and my sisters are the people right right here. Jesus said they're right here in this room here. Right. My brothers and sisters, they said that he, the people said they're outside. Oh, they're in here. Amen. Now, if you're able to do that, you got it. Yeah. You have assurance. You've got it. Here's another one. You're in the middle of something that's not pleasant, and yet you know it's, I'm going to come out of this. Mm -hmm. This thing's going to end up all right. Amen. You're convinced of it. So you reason like this, Philippians 1.19. I know that this shall turn out to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation. Mm -hmm and my hope that in nothing <laughs> when it's all over in nothing I shall be ashamed Amen. I know that but with all boldness as with all ways, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether by, by, by life or by death so you're in a straight 
betwixt the two. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. But you look down life's road and you say, I see some light down there. Uh -huh. I'm not always going to be in this situation. Amen. So by God's grace, I'm going to last it out. I'm going to endure it. I mean, it may move me to tears, but I'll weep, knowing that weeping may endure for the night, may not, may not too. May endure for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. I may be Amen. sowing seed, and it's causing me a lot of tears, but he that goeth forth sowing precious seed shall doubtless come rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. I know I'm not laboring in vain. I know it doesn't look good. I know we look kind of small, Lord. I know we don't have famous people. And I know I'm, I'm presently, I feel like a worm. Like I'm a worm and no man, as the scripture says. But I've read your promises, Lord. And I know it's not going to always be this way. I know this thing's going to turn out to my salvation. You're going to work all things together for my good. And I'm going to endure this in that hope. If you can do that, you got it. Amen. You have assurance. Amen. That's what has enabled you. Yes. See, to do that. That's knowing all things that Romans 8.28 says, knowing that all things work together for, the, for good. They don't just like fall together. It's God working them together. He's going to work them all together. See, there's some ingredients in life that of themselves are hard to digest. There's some recipes, you know, you have to put a little cayenne pepper in it. Well, if you just swallow down a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, well, <laughs> you got experiences of life like that. There's, see, it's by design. Life is made up with some of these things that of themselves, they're bitter herbs, but when you throw it in there with the rest, it kind of flavors it up a little bit. <laughs> it kind of make, makes it so it's more endurable. Say, I thank you, Lord, I'm not a dry land sailor. But I've learned how to trust while I'm a bobbing up and down in the deep for a day and a night. Yeah, I learned how to trust when the ship was breaking apart. I learned how to trust when they had to pull me into the barracks to keep the crowd from tearing me in pieces. So I learned how to trust in that. I know that you're working it out together for good. So when they stand before the Lord in that great day, he'll say, well, I, I see the record books record here that you suffered loss for my sake. <laughs> you won't be thinking about what you suffered loss of after that, let me tell you. Now, if you're able to live with that in mind, and you can now, I know, I know most of you, you can do this. You got it, you got assurance. That's your evidence that you have it. And knowing it, adapting to the circumstance. This is hard for some people. Other people, they can adapt. Some people, brother, have lived this out right before our very eyes. You know, they lost everything they had. And they, they kept, they adapted. They adapted. Without compromise, they adapted. They worked the thing out. And then they come out without the smell of smoke in their clothes, right? Here it is in Philippians 4.12. I know both how to be abased, get down there at the bottom of the pile, and how to abound everywhere and in all things. I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I've learned to do that. What is that? That's proof you've got assurance, been able to adapt. As I say, we've got several witnesses of this. Now, here's a little more lofty thing here, but let's say that by human estimation, you don't have really a lot to give. By human estimation, you don't have a lot to give. But what you did give, you're confident God can keep it. And you're willing to wait. You know you're not a great preacher, you're not a great teacher. You're great at something, though. I can tell you that. You're great at something. 
See, a reason like this. 2 Timothy 1, 12. For this cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I believed. See? <laughs> I am more acquainted with God than I am with trouble. I know who I believed. I'm persuaded he's able. I'm persuaded now. He's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Those treasures I laid up in heaven, he's able to keep them. That resolve I made, as much as in me is, he's able to keep that. You're convinced of that. You, you don't know how it's all going to pan out. It isn't that you know exactly how you're going to react to everything, but you know, and I know God... If I just don't take anything away that I've given to God, if I, if I don't try and take it back or go back on my resolve, I know God's able to keep what I've committed to Him. Amen. If nobody in the world ever remembers it, you're convinced God will. All right, if you can do that, that's your proof. You got it. Yeah. You've got assurance. Here's a, another high note. Philippians 1.23, I'm on a straight betwixt the two. I got two decisions here, and it's hard for me to make up my mind. I have a desire to depart, leave the world, and to be with Christ, which is far better. But then he added, but for you, to the Philippians, just, I, I need to stay because you're not up to speed yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not up to speed yet, so i, I got to remain for your sake. I've got to i got to help get you up to the place where I can leave without it being a handicap to you. A willingness to depart. You got it. You got it. If you have that, you, you got it. You've got assurance. It's yours if you're willing to depart. Lord, my preference is to go. You know it, Lord. Not just to get out of trouble, but to get there. Yeah. I'm willing to go. But Lord, if my work's not done, I don't want to go yet. Yeah. If my work's not done, I want to finish my work. You've got that attitude. You've got assurance. You, you, you are setting your affection on things above. You're actually developing an appetite for the things above. A preference for them. A longing for them appetite for them. You're setting your face on things above, not on things on the earth. You're actually doing that. You got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got assurance. That's why you're doing that. Yeah. You're assured that there are things above. Well, why would you seek them? See? Here's another one. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Then the six, that's 611, Ephesians 613 says, having done all to stand. So let's say you've survived a temptation. The evil day, that's an especially hard assault. It was hard on your heart. It was hard on your mind. It was hard on every part of you. But you survived. That's proof you got assurance. Your survival yeah. is proof you got assurance. Here's another. When we're talking about evidences of assurance. First Peter 1 Peter 1.8 Whom have ye not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So you get to the point you actually, the anticipation of being with the Lord makes you joyful. Have you noticed how these heaven songs, how joyful they are? Yeah. Like you enter, you can enter in, boy, your heart being lifted up. You got it. You got it. You got assurance. That's what caused that, caused that to happen. Let me give you one more. The ability to survive or to come back, to recoup. Here it is, 2 Corinthians 4 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed. We can't figure it, out, figure it out, but not in despair. We're persecuted, not forsaken. We're cast down, not destroyed as we get up. Knock us down. Hey, we, some of us have been knocked down several times. We got up. Why? You had it. 
you had assurance. That's the evidence of it, see? So the evidence of assurance is beyond the reach of the disinterested. You can just by the nature of the things we talked about. This is just a sampling, just a brief sampling of them. The evidence is found in the individual that possesses the insurance, assurance. It's not found outside of himself. You can't reach outside of yourself and try and figure out if you got assurance. And what it boils down to is how you've reacted to what God has said and to the various circumstances of life and to the brethren. How did you react to all those? That will tell you whether you've got assurance or not. Where assurance is present, it can be identified by the people who possess it. But see what these things aren't talked about. People don't think about it much. They just assume you can't know. But this would be like telling a runner that trained all year for a race and then he's not sure whether he's really in the race. He's thinking as he's running along, I wonder if I'm really in the race. I wonder if I got to the right place. He couldn't run very well. The evidence of assurance rests in the area of spiritual understanding and discernment. When you're able to see, see, I'm not bragging, but I can see. I find myself doing what God said to do. You've got assurance. Running the race, keeping the faith, pressing toward the mark, resisting the devil, being strong, You've got to come to the point where those things are more than requirements. They are requirements. But when you can see in them, they're, they're, as you do them, they become, they convert from requirement to evidence. And there's a lot of these, brethren. I, try, I trust that I've been able to see at least a few of these, hopefully a lot of them. And at your heart, in your heart, you can see, I, I've, got a, I've got assurance. Or I never would have got as far as I've gotten. Amen. Brother Aaron has our exhortation tonight.